but in the end, they were left with 221 people on board the ship with no way of getting off other than jumping into the water. This is where the story really got so interesting and so exciting, Jesse. <laughs>、hey、guys, welcome back to another video, and in today's video, we are back in Roblox, and today, I'm going to be showcasing a game that I've been working on for quite a while now with the guys over at VVG. Now it's not out yet, but it's coming soon, and I'll be joined by a special guest. So, yeah, guys, let's get into the video. Alright, so here we are, and here we have the wonderful Oceanos, and we are joined by Andrew Pike. Andrew Pike, why don't you introduce yourself for the audience? I know that we have talked extensively, but.、Uh, Who are you and how do you relate to the Oceano story? Thank you so much for the invitation, Jesse, and really good to be part of this. So, I'm a lawyer. I'm based in Durban, South Africa, with a law firm called Bowman's. And my speciality is ships and ports. And back in 1991, when the Oceano sank, I was one of the lawyers involved in the investigation. So, we were representing the owners of the ship and also their third party insurers. And we had to investigate why the ship sank so that the owners would be able to bring a claim against their insurers. I knew quite a lot about the technical reasons for the sinking of this ship, but I'd never really got to the bottom of the, the human story. And a few years ago, I was encouraged by a journalist to write my story and I wrote some of it, and she was so excited and said, This just has to turn into a book. And eventually, what happened was I came up with a book published in South Africa called Against All Odds The Epic Story of the Oceanus Rescue. And then last year, the book was republished in the United States and Canada as May Day off the Wild Coast, fully available in North America and, in fact, much of the world at the moment under that heading, May Day off the Wild Coast. And it's a great, great adventure story. And Jesse, I'm just so grateful to you for doing the、uh, technical analysis of this sinking. You've done an incredible job, and、uh, I, I can't wait for you to share this in, in every form that you've done it. Yeah, thank you so much. I really do appreciate that. And, you know, the book, I've read it, I've got both copies. It's a fantastic book, and a link. If you want to get that book, will be down in the description. So, yeah, what a fantastic book and what a fantastic guest to have for showcasing this video game. So, let's get started with a little tour of the Oceanos. And feel free, Andrew, to kind of give us some information about what these areas are around the ship, what happened during the sinking, and then we'll actually hop over to a rough cut of the sinking. And we'll see how the ship actually sank. So let's get going. All right, so here we are on the forecastle deck of the MTS Oceanos. You can see that this has been wonderfully detailed by JL Killen. He's one of the people who has worked on this project and he's done some great work with the equipment here. So a lot of research was actually poured into this because there are very limited photos of this space. Only during the sinking did we get a great view of this area. So you can see it's been、uh, nicely done here. I think it's really well done. And moving aft, we have the spare anchors and spare propellers. Now, Andrew, for the people that are not aware, why do ships have spare propellers? Well, the short answer, Jesse, is that ships get into trouble from time to time. And one of the things that can happen is a propeller can、uh, touch the, the bottom if the ship. Goes through shallow water and it can get damaged. If you have damage on a propeller, it, it creates a particular vibration through the ship and causes, can cause quite a lot of damage to engine parts. So you have to have a spare propeller in case something happens. You know, one of the hazards in modern times is that containers fall off ships every now and again. And if another ship hits a container, It can easily damage the hull and the propellers,、um, and you, you just have to have spares available in case something happens along the way. Absolutely, and that's why the Oceanus actually had two spare propellers. Unfortunately, they were never ever used and they went down with the ship. But let's keep moving. So now we're going to make our way into the interiors of the vessel. So we're actually going to go through a door that's a little bit hidden. This is actually part of the original ship superstructure. And it's really cool to see that it was still on the Oceanos when she went down or after her refit. So, going through, we have one of the lounges here. We've got some equipment set up. We've got a bunch of chairs. This is one of the lounges that people actually stayed in. 
during the voyages, and it was basically one of the rooms that was renovated during her refits. Here we have the main staircase. This is where people would come down the stairs and actually walk around and go down to their cabins and whatnot, and then obviously down these halls would be the cabin, so very cool. Anyone watching this has been on a ship, you'll know that it's quite claustrophobic down there. So you can imagine that while everything is fine, life is fine down those corridors, but start getting a ship in trouble and it gets pretty claustrophobic and pretty hectic and pretty scary there. And we'll learn a lot more about that as we go. So here we are at the stern of the vessel. It is another very uh, small space, but it was a great place for the crew to come out, have a smoke or just relax or just kind of bathe in the sun or whatever. This was the crew deck. It was also accessible to some passengers, but not many. Going up, we're gonna go onto the pool deck. This is gonna be our last stop for our very short tour, and then we're actually gonna be going on to the sinking, which will be very interesting. Here we have the pool deck, and I know, Andrew, this is gonna be a space that's gonna come up over and over again in the sinking. Yeah, hugely important. Uh, it became pivotal in the whole rescue effort, and, you know, right now it just looks like a pretty cool pool deck, but it really was one of the key areas on the ship where people got involved in this rescue. And as you say, we'll come back to this in some detail later. Yeah, so let's go ahead. Let's move on to August 4th, or actually August 3rd, 1991, at the East London port in South Africa. All right, so here we are. We are at the East London docks in South Africa, and here we have the Oceanos like we did before, however this time it's actually in an environment, it's not just floating in space. So, Andrew, what were the conditions like? What was this ship in general? Was it a South African ship, a Greek ship? What was it? Yeah, so, Jesse, this was a Greek ship. It was pretty old, it was nearly 40 years old, and it had been converted from a cargo ship into a passenger ship at some point in time. So, it had issues, and particularly it wasn't very comfortable for passengers. But nonetheless, it could carry 600 odd passengers and crew. And it was on an eight month charter in South African waters. So cruising between the South African ports and then also some of the, ocean, the islands in the Indian Ocean. In addition to the crew, there were a number of ships entertainers who were part of the chartering company TFC Tours, which was a big holiday company in South Africa at the time. And the ship was sailing from East London in a northerly direction towards Durban. And it was only a, a, a sort of an overnight cruise intended, and it was part of some longer voyage from Cape Town. What happened was that on the 3rd of August, Saturday, the weather conditions blew up and they were really pretty horrible. So the ship was delayed in departure because they knew that there were huge waves, huge wind and so on blowing up the coast and I think that the captain delayed the departure to try and see if the if the weather would settle down but in fact it didn't and I think the captain was under pressure to sail the ship to get to Durban in time to pick up passengers for its next voyage and so finally at about 16:30 4:30 p.m. local time the ship set sail into really terrible weather huge storm blowing up from the southern ocean and in that part of the coastline is also a huge surface ocean current called the Agullas Current, which runs from north in a southerly direction. And so when you've got current blowing up against uh, the wind or flowing against uh, howling winds, you get terrible sea conditions and particularly you get these rogue or freak waves, which you know can blow up to 60, 70, 80 feet high. And they are really frightening and they've swallowed some ships. That section of coastline called the Wild Coast is something which I guess is the South African equivalent of the Bermuda Triangle. Ships have just disappeared there without a trace. A lot of ships get broken and sunk there and it's a pretty scary place when the weather's bad. It's a very beautiful place, I have to say, very unpopulated. You know, the name suggests it all. It's pretty wild there. So, actually, we are currently leaving East London. We'll be out of the port in just a minute or two here, but here we go. We are actually leaving. So, this is similar to what some of the passengers may have seen as they were up on this deck. And you can see if we turn around, you can see the bridge 
just up there. Let's go up to the bridge. Let's see what the captain would have been seeing at this moment in time. All right, so here we are on the bridge, and you can see that we are just heading out to sea. Now, obviously, Roblox is Roblox, and real life is real life, and there are definitely more things in real life than there are in Roblox, and you can see here that there would probably be rain, heavy winds, the seas would be crashing, unlike here, and uh, it would be pretty nasty, but here we are. We are actually leaving now, and you can see the uh, tugs will just disappear in a minute, and then it will just be us going out to sea, so there we go. Yeah, really interesting that the wind force was so strong as the ship was leaving that she was nearly blown onto that breakwater, which is the big wall that protects the port. And the tugs had to push pretty hard to keep her off there and get her back on course. Um, the ship would also have had a pilot on board who is provided by the port authority. And the pilot guides the ship out because he usually knows where the, the sea currents are and where the dangers are for the ship. So there would have been a pilot up on the bridge with the captain telling him steer to port, steer to starboard, engine, you know, uh, stronger, less. And he would then get off the ship onto a little pilot boat that, that runs alongside the ship. And then the captain is on his own pretty much with his crew heading out into the blue yonder. Now, something is going on below decks that not the passengers in the lounges know. And what was going on down there? As I said, this ship originated as a cargo ship. And one of the problems that kept cropping up was that passengers would complain about the smell of sewage. And that's because the sewage system was getting blocked. And our theory is that when the ship was converted, it was just never properly converted to cater for 600 people on board. So down below in the auxiliary engine room, the crew, the engineers were working on the sewage system to try and unblock it because it was, it was just creating a bad stink in the ship. And so they had removed a pipe from a watertight bulkhead, which is like a steel wall in the ship in order to, to get all the, all the muck out of the pipe basically. And they were busy working on a valve and with this pipe out and there was a whole drama in the engine room as they were trying to sort this all out so yeah that was what was going on below decks but what was happening up in the lounges i know that they were planning on having a sort of sail away party but that never really happened out on the pool deck it instead happened in the lounge and what was that experience like yeah exactly so the pool deck was was pretty much uninhabitable there was howling wind it was cold it was unpleasant and the ship was rolling around it was just neither safe nor pleasant to be up on the pool deck so the sail away party was moved downstairs into a, 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 a huge lounge uh, the four seasons lounge and there were musicians, uh, they had musical gear, piano, drums, and so on, on, on a stage there. And passengers were, were summoned into the, into the lounge. Um, because it had been a pretty late sailing away, a number of the passengers were, were invited into the dining room for the first sitting. And they were really struggling to, to eat their dinner. It was sort of falling off the tables and the waiters were dropping stuff all over. But, you know, one of the big issues with the passengers was that, that half of them, if not more, were pretty seasick. And so some were staying in their cabins. But those who weren't seasick and weren't eating their dinner were in the lounge for a party. And, you know, the party started and the entertainers were doing the best they could and they were conga lines and people were falling over each other and falling on the floor and they were in danger of hurting themselves because the ship was rolling so heavily in these these high seas and eventually the entertainers called it a day and uh, you know they carried on you know, playing music and so on but i think that they wanted to kind of calm things down so that no one hurt themselves but, you know, you can see pretty much how the ship is rolling around and it was rolling through huge pitches and, and, and so on, um, through huge angles because the wave heights at that time were, were absolutely enormous already, 40, 50 feet, I guess. And with heavy winds blowing, that ship 
was not designed for carrying passengers, so it was pretty uncomfortable at the best of times. But in those sort of seas, it was really just not a lot of fun to be anywhere other than probably on your back in your bed. Yeah, and I just got to pop in just a couple seconds ago, the power would have gone out. But since we are looking at a very early draft of the sinking, the lights do not go out quite yet. But we'll just imagine that the power has gone out and it's very difficult to see. So obviously in this case, it's better for us because the power stayed on. But uh, for the passengers, it has just gone pitch black and the emergency lights wouldn't come on for a couple more minutes. Yeah, so there was a reason why it went pitch black. And the reason was to do with what was happening below deck. So earlier I spoke about the engineers working on that system. And while they were working, suddenly water came pouring in the side of the ship. So there's a, an inlet valve which lets water into a container, if I can call it that, called a sea chest, which is used for cooling generators. And that thing popped off the side of the ship. And we figured that what happened was that the ship touched the bottom when she was leaving the harbor of Reunion, which is one of the Indian Ocean Islands, two weeks earlier. And that she had a bit of damage that the captain never knew about. And we think that what happened in that heavy weather was that one of these freak waves probably knocked off part of the shell plating water came pouring through that sea chest and into the space where the engineers were working. There was so much water and it comes at such pressure when people are far below deck that the engineers had no chance of stemming the flow. So the best they could do was close the watertight doors behind them and run out of there. But the engineers knew something that no one else knew and that was that they were pretty sure the ship was going to sink. And how do we know that? Well, they all put on their life jackets and headed up to the top deck of the ship. And when an engineer does that, you can be pretty sure that he knows that that ship's not going to stay afloat for, for too long. Oh, absolutely, so, yeah. Yeah, so that's what that's what happened. And But they, they did obviously tell the captain what was going on. And he put out a mayday signal to the to the South African Rescue Coordination Center in near Cape Town at um, about 11.30 or so. And that was, that was about all that he did. And for the, for the rest, um, what happened was that he and his, or his senior officers anyway, then launched a lifeboat and tried to escape from the ship without telling anyone that the ship was sinking. So the entertainers themselves had to find out that the ship was sinking some way. And we, I'm sure we'll get to that part of the story in a moment, Jesse. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Because one of, the, uh, one of the, the heroes in the story was an entertainer called Moss Hills. So he was the guitar player in a, in a duo with his wife. And Moss Hills was the one who discovered that the ship was sinking. And he discovered it through a very interesting way. He went down below and he took this footage that you're about to see right now. When all the lights went out, and the entertainers started tumbling to the fact that there was something seriously wrong with the ship. The engines had stopped by then. It was dark. The ship was pitching around and rolling. And the entertainers thought, well, you know, let's try and keep the mood light. So Moss Hills and a guy called Robin Boltman, who was the magician on board and was also the acting cruise director, pulled out their guitars and they were playing some music and having some sing-alongs but you can imagine this is a pretty dire situation people don't feel much like singing along but these guys were doing the best they could to entertain the passengers but eventually they the ship was starting to list which means to lean over onto the starboard side which is the the right hand side of the ship if you're looking forwards on it and it was starting to list more and more and it was getting more and more uncomfortable 
And once Moss Hills found out that this ship was actually sinking, the entertainers figured out pretty quickly that if anyone stayed inside the lounge or in their cabins, if the ship turned turtle or sank, they were going to go down with it. So what they started doing was herding passengers outside onto the, the deck. Um, so remember, I said just now that the senior officers had already left, disgracefully, I have to say, in a lifeboat. And so it was over to the entertainers who are not seamen, they're guitarists and magicians and singers and dancers and things, to try and help passengers to escape from the ship. And what they did was they herded people out onto the 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 sort of weather deck and they started loading them into lifeboats but remember now the ship is listing over to starboard and it's listing more and more so what you've got is lifeboats on the starboard side of the ship swinging wildly backwards and forwards away from the ship to the ship so it's really dangerous to jump over that gap from the ship into the lifeboat and they were doing some amazing things you know moss hills and got a couple of guys to help him and they tore a door off and they used the door as a type of gangplank between the ship and the and and the lifeboat but you know it still meant that people were risking a fall into you know these terrible waters um risking hurting themselves falling into the lifeboats but they had to get off the ship somehow because by now it was pretty clear the ship was sinking and no one was coming to help them. And so that's what they did. The lifeboats filled up pretty quickly on the starboard side, remembering that the officers had already taken one of them. And so they then started trying to launch lifeboats on the port side, on the left-hand side of the ship. But now you'll figure out that the ship is listing in the opposite direction. So the lifeboats are resting hard up against the ship and are very difficult to launch. It was very dangerous. So while the entertainers were trying to launch lifeboats on the port side, they were getting stuck. They were hanging in, in mid-air. And eventually they realized it was just going to be too dangerous to launch those things. So they actually lowered a couple of them empty in the hope that they could pick up survivors in the water at a later stage. But the result was that they managed to get some lifeboats away with the number of passengers. But in the end, they were left with 221 people on board the ship with no way of getting off other than jumping into the water. And this is where the story really got, got so interesting and so exciting, Jesse. Oh, absolutely. And we are just scratching the tip of the iceberg with this one here. So as you can see, the sun has just risen over the horizon there, and the time is now 6.17 a.m. So around this time, helicopters are arriving, and who even called these helicopters? Because we know it wasn't the captain. Yeah, so the captain had put out that Mayday signal around 11 p.m. the, the previous night, and the South African Maritime Rescue Coordination Center put out a signal to all shipping in the area. And so ships started converging, you know, cargo ships and fishing vessels and so on, converging on the Oceanus to come and help because that's what they've got to do as a matter of, of you know, the law of the sea. But the Maritime Coordination Center also called the Air Force and they said, we need some help. And so the Air Force dispatched helicopters from Durban, from Pretoria, from Cape Town. And these guys all started coming towards the, 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 the scene of the casualty. At the same time, the South African Navy launched a number of ships from Durban and they set out, but they were going to take five, six hours to get there. The helicopters were going to get there quickest. And at dawn, the first of the helicopters arrived and they landed on the shore, which was probably about uh, three, four miles away. Um, they managed to get rid of extra weight. They took some divers on board and they flew out to the Oceanus to start the rescue and try and get those 221 passengers off, Jesse. Yeah, it's insane. I mean, you have to think all these people, and when they're arriving, all they see are little orange ants. 
and with the life jackets on that's what they look like you know you're looking at this huge deck in comparison to the people standing on it and you just see people lined up let's say actually all the way from you can correct me if i'm wrong from this but all the way from the promenade down underneath the lifeboat deck all the way around down these stairs to the deck here you have people lined up and you can see it in the video footage it's an insane sight to see because these people have no other way off except the helicopter but unfortunately not all the helicopters were going to be able to take everyone on board so how did they get off the ship yeah so i mean you can see from what's what's on the screen now that the ship is now listing crazy and it's hard for people to to stay on the deck or stay upright on the deck they're hanging on to the rails they're hanging on to ropes they're doing what they can just to stay on board the helicopters can't land on something that's at that angle and in any event now the the front of the ship the bow is sort of dipping into the water it's hugely dangerous no helicopter can land on this ship and worse still is you've got massive headwinds so you know something like 80 knots which uh which i guess is what uh, you know 100 miles an hour or thereabouts um blowing from the south so the helicopters have now got to position themselves in front of the ship and lower a diver on onto the ship so this hero paul wiley he was a 22 year old able seaman in the south african navy and he was a diver they put him onto the ship at great risk to himself uh, and in fact he hurt himself when he when they dropped him by mistake onto the ship but in any event paul then started loading passengers two by two into harnesses which were being lowered by the helicopters so typically uh, there would be a helicopter it would lower a harness paul would put the harness over two people's heads or shoulders and they would be winched up to the helicopter and then they would lower the harness again Paul would somehow snare it and load the next two people but that was going slowly and he was at one end of the ship so Moss Hill started doing the same exercise at the other end so now you had two helicopters working at the same time over the ship and as soon as a, as a helicopter was full it could take sort of 30 odd people I guess um, it would head back to the coastline and start dropping people off at a local hotel called the Haven and and the next heli helicopter would take its place it had been lined up in a queue and they worked out this method where helicopters were on a sort of rotation basis picking people up circling around picking more people up and slowly ferrying them back to the shore but all the while you've got you know the the ship is going down and it's pretty clear that it's going down and Paul Wiley said to me at one stage he looked at the task that had to be performed with all these passengers on board and how slowly they were being lifted off and he just said to me it was at that moment that I was pretty sure I knew how I was going to die and that was going down with the ship and all these passengers you know helicopters running out of fuel they had to go back to the shore and fuel up um, it, and it was terrifying for the passengers on board you, as you can imagine that you know if Paul thought he was going to die that way and he was an experienced diver you can imagine what the passengers were thinking yeah and you know just a couple minutes ago we saw the bow just beginning to flood now it's unbelievably flooded at this stage but people actually jumped from the bow because Lorraine Betts the uh, tour director brought these people basically onto the bow of the ship and said you have to jump they had to jump into the water and a Navy diver would pull them into a Zodiac lifeboat which would have been stored on the bow of the ship so they were able to be rescued and then put onto a lifeboat of cargo ship and then taken to the cargo ship and then they had to be hoisted up or they had to climb up this netting to get into the cargo ship so it was an unbelievable sight and you have to remember again as Andrew said the ship is rolling around not just the Oceanus but these cargo ships at this point in the sinking everybody is off but uh, we do know that a couple of Navy divers I believe four went down onto the ship basically before it went down just to run through the ship check it out make sure no one was inside and then they left but uh, now the ship is abandoned and it is sinking 
on its own. No one knew where anyone was because for the most part, women and children went off first by helicopters and some of them went off by ship and the husbands stayed behind. So no one knew where anyone was. And you know, that was back in the day where there were no cell phones, communications were, were pretty scanty. It was so hard to coordinate this whole thing and it was being coordinated by one aircraft flying around overhead, a fixed wing aircraft of the South African Defence Force that was sort of communicating with Robin Boltman of all people, the, the magician who was on the, on the bridge trying to man a VHF radio. He had no experience in, in those sort of communications and he was trying to speak to the, to the rescue ships in the vicinity, to the National Sea Rescue Institute. He was speaking to, to the Defence Force and to the Maritime Rescue Coordination Centre. So you can imagine you know what a heroic job he did he has this this you know stand-up comic and, and magician who's suddenly the center the front and center of this rescue in the meantime you've got moss hills and a couple of his entertainer colleagues running around and putting people onto helicopters and launching lifeboats and doing some really heroic stuff in the most trying circumstances and Unbelievably, as you said, JC, everyone got off before the ship went down. Yeah, and what's amazing is I know I've seen so many comments that the uh, Oceano sank like the Titanic. It went vertical. You know, you never see that. And if you look at this site here, Andrew, would you say that the ship is pretty much in trouble now? There are only two possible outcomes here, JC, and the one is that she goes nose down, the other is that she rolls over. And either way she's lost all of her stability and stability is is king on a ship oh, once absolutely. a ship has lost the the center of gravity has lost her stability there's no coming back from that you can't pump that off you can't save that ship she's going down and the ship was 150 meters long what's that about 500 feet and so the the water depth was 90 meters or just over 90 meters about 300 feet, I guess. So, in fact, what she did is that she tipped straight down, nose first, as you say, just like the Titanic, and balanced on her bow for a, a period. And it was the most incredible sight to, to watch in, in real life, and you can still find that on YouTube, I guess. And uh, here we see her going down, and. Uh, she gets down to a point where part of her stern is sticking out of the water uh, as she balances, balances on her bow. And you can see it is just the air is beginning to push aft as water fills the interior spaces. You've got basically huge drafts of air forcing upward, forcing its way out of the ship. And there are scenes of this video where you can see just air blasting through doorways at the stern of the ship. We're going to try to recreate that here, why don't we? So, let's go ahead, let's get the camera up here. So, yeah, it is a very, you know, reminiscent sight of that video. You can see the ship is going down. It is, it's, it's done. There is no going back from this, as you said. And uh, here she goes, she's going vertical. Now, if we actually go under the water, if I can get down there in time, you'll notice we do not have water effects yet. Once again, everything that you're seeing is subject to change. But the bow is going down, and it's basically digging into the seabed, crushing the bow slightly, and we do see that on the rack. And now that the ship is just standing up, all of this air coming off of the coastline is blowing against the ship. You see the dust coming off. It rotates on its bow and begins that slight tilt down to where she rests today. Yeah, it was incredible watching that in, in real time. The... Uh amount of dust that came blowing out of that ship. You kind of figure that someone hadn't done all their, their house cleaning <laughs> before she went yeah, down. Yeah, absolutely. And there she goes. In a minute, we are going to discuss the actual investigation, which you were a part of, of course, Andrew. So there goes the yeah. ship going down.
All right, so we're back to the floating Oceanos, I guess. It doesn't have an ocean. It's a great kind of view, a profile view. You can get a lot of views of the ship without having to worry about water or anything, which obviously the Oceanos had to worry about water in its final few hours. But uh, here we have the Oceanos. Now, Andrew, we did talk about how the ship started flooding. We had that damage there, but what was the investigation like? How difficult was it? Was it an easy job or was it a difficult job? How did you find the information? How did you come to the conclusion that you did? Well, Jesse, it was a hugely difficult job. And one of the main reasons is that the crew were very scared of being arrested in South Africa for negligence, for causing, you know, the loss of the ship. Although fortunately there was no loss of life. But nonetheless, the South African Department of Transport was running an inquiry and they were asking some pretty difficult questions and my job as I said earlier was to investigate the sinking of the ship but for the benefit of the owners particularly who would have had an insurance claim and now to prove their insurance claim they had to prove that this ship sank as a result of what's called a peril of the sea which is a term used in insurance policies, marine insurance policies, and that it didn't sink just because of, of wear and tear. And so crew were trying to protect their owner. They thought they didn't, shouldn't give any secrets away. So they were keeping secrets from us, the owner's lawyers. And it was hugely difficult to get any information out of them. And what we had to do was recreate the sinking and we got a number of experts involved, but in particular, I sat and worked with a naval architect who is a guy that designs ships. And what he did was he took drawings of the ship and he recreated it on his computer. And so what we had to do was we had to work out how the water got in. And as we explained earlier, it got into the engine room or the auxiliary engine room, but the engineers closed the watertight doors. And so there was this mystery about how the ship sank, because once you've closed watertight doors, ships are designed to stay afloat, even if there's a compartment that's flooded. And yet the ship sank. And so we knew that the water had to have got out of this watertight space into the rest of the ship. And the, the mystery was about figuring that one out without the cooperation of the crew and without knowing what was going on with the sewage system and all of that. And so what we did was we interviewed all sorts of people. We interviewed the crew and funnily enough, the junior crew who were not Greeks, they were Filipinos and Egyptians and all sorts of things. They were more keen to give us information than the senior officers. The senior officers, for them, it was a big secret because they were the guys whose, whose necks were on the line. But we also interviewed passengers. We interviewed entertainers. We got the video footage from Moss Hills. And our naval architect basically tracked the water through the ship and he made the ship sink again on his computer, much in the way you've done this, Jesse. He was able to then almost reverse engineer the sinking and work back to sort of, well, this is how the water must have traveled because the ship listed to the starboard side and it, it went down by the bow. And he was able to recreate the whole sinking by reference to all the people we interviewed and all the evidence we managed to gather. And finally, we figured out, well, it could only have gone, the water could only have taken this particular route. And all we had to do was find out how it took that route. And in fact, it took a little while. We got some information from one or two junior crew members, who, you know, junior engineers who had been working and saw things happening and they were kind of trying to explain to us. But finally, the answer came out during when the inquiry moved from South Africa to Greece and I think the crew felt a bit more comfortable and a bit safer confessing all to the owners, lawyers and, and experts in, in Greece. So it was a pretty tough investigation. We got to the point where we were able to persuade the insurers that the initial breach of the ship's hull was probably because of a freak wave it was probably related to the fact that the ship touched the bottom when she was leaving the harbor in reunion and we had some video footage of that happening which was quite coincidental a passenger who'd been on that voyage came forward and gave us that video footage so we knew that something had happened in reunion and that the 
ship's captain had done nothing about it or hadn't investigated it. And so between that and the heavy weather and the fact that the engineers were negligent, they should never have been doing that work while the ship was at sea. They should have done that work while the ship was still on the shore. Uh, we were able to get the claim across the line for the owners and they got paid out quite a lot of money back in the day. Wow, so let me ask you, what happened to the crew? Did they talk to you? What happened with that? Yeah, so Jesse, they never spoke to us. They, you know, they, I say that, they, they spoke to us, but they withheld information mm. from us that was critical to our technical investigation. They were also in some disgrace for deserting the ship. So the captain had deserted the ship with one of the first helicopters and the officers, as I said, had deserted with a lifeboat. And so they were in trouble for that. And they tried to explain it. The captain said he'd gone for help on ashore and to coordinate the rescue ashore. But that was absolute nonsense. And the Greek Ministry of Merchant Marine, as it was then known, I don't know if they still call it that, did their own investigation and they made a finding that the captain and officers were negligent for allowing the ship to sink. Funnily enough, they didn't really criticize them for deserting the ship. And they concluded that because everyone was saved, it wasn't such a bad thing to have deserted the ship. It was the most strange leap of logic from the Greek investigators, but that's what their conclusion was. But they were all found guilty of negligence. There's no real record of what happened to them, but the, the sort of informal, unofficial information that I have is that they got a bit of a slap on the wrist and nothing too serious happened to them. And I think that that's because there was fortunately no loss of life and very few people were injured and the injuries that there were were fairly minor. You know, if you compare that to the captain of the Costa Concordia, which sank off the Italian coast about 10, 10 years ago, you know, 30 people died on that ship and he's, he went to jail for 15 years for doing much the same thing, deserting the ship. and. So, you know, I think that the authorities take a pretty strong view on loss of life caused by negligence. And where there was no loss of life, I think that they kind of let it go. We didn't have claims in those days for post-traumatic stress. That's a more modern day thing. So, you know, today the owners would have taken a complete bath from passengers all claiming for stress. And we know a number of those passengers were hugely stressed and some spent time in hospital afterwards. Yeah, it was a hugely stressful situation. But, you know, if you look at the big picture, you see everyone lived. That's something that never happens in situations like that. Yeah, but I mean, what's interesting, and if you're comparing the two, the Costa Concordia sank in pretty shallow water. It didn't, in fact, sink. It just toppled over in shallow water. And it was it was in calm conditions. You compare that to the Oceanus, which was, was five, four or five nautical miles offshore, huge waves which were measured on a, a local weather station that night, going up to sort of 80, 90 feet. And no one died. It was the most incredible maritime rescue, I believe, in maritime history. It was simply off the wall in terms of the unlikelihood of everyone getting off and living. Absolutely. Now, where can people read about this? Because this story is just too big for a video game, just too big for a movie. So where can people read about it? So, Jesse, as I mentioned earlier, I've written this book Mayday Off the Wild Coast, the epic story of the Oceanus rescue. It really is a great story. It's a, it's a story that was too good not to be told. And I didn't want the story to sort of die of old age, if you like. So, you know, probably anyone below the age of 40 has no idea about the story. And I wanted to tell the whole story from the perspective of all of the stakeholders, all of the players. So I, I spoke about the story from the perspective of rescue ships, I interviewed crew members, I interviewed entertainers, I interviewed passengers, I interviewed helicopter pilots and the guys in charge of the Maritime Rescue Coordination Center. And I had to pull that all together in a, 
in a cohesive timeline. Because remember, I'm now interviewing these people decades later, and they've got sort of memories which are conflating facts and not really remembering everything as other people remember it. So it was a pretty much of a mission to put this together. But I wrote it as a story and with, with everyone, you know, everyone's input put into the story. And it makes for such an exciting read. You can't believe the number of people who picked up that book and contacted me afterwards and said, I just couldn't put this book down. So you can find the book either in hard copy or in e-form through Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble, any of the major, major bookstores. It was published in North America last year. It's still pretty fresh. You'll probably find some reviews on Amazon, on Goodreads. So you have such a good understanding of what happened, but you kind of can't come away having read that story without being in some awe of what really was achieved by particularly the Air Force and the rescue ships that, that came to the help of this ship. Absolutely, Andrew. It's been a pleasure having you here and talking about the sinking once again, 31 years on from it actually going down. So yeah, if you guys have enjoyed this, remember to leave a like and a comment, and I'll see you next time, guys. Goodbye.